So without further ado, I'd like to invite Vitalik on stage to talk about ideas for things worth building. Okay, hello everyone. Okay, so how are you today? We want. <laughs> okay. Okay. Aww. Okay. So. Great. Thank you. So, today, um, I what I wanted to talk about is uh, a bit of a kind of the intersection between um, some of the things that are happening in the Ethereum space. On a like very t from a very technological point of view, um, so there's a lot of exciting things happening in Ethereum technology with uh, scaling, privacy, um, a lot um, a lot of other different topics, and just some ideas for what can happen on the uh, what, what kinds of things I think might make sense to start building um, on the application layer. Now we sometimes think of uh, technology and applications as being separate, but I think it's actually very important to think about them together uh, because uh, improvements to technology can make new kinds of applications possible, right? They can make applications possible by making them cheaper. Sometimes they can make applications possible by uh, creating new tools, by making it safer to use the Ethereum blockchain, which can make um, applications more accessible. Um, and so, what what are we yeah, going to see from our technology in the next few years? And what does this mean for what kinds of things it makes sense for people to really start building today? Um, so I feel like we've, at least on the internet and on the Reddit and the Twitter and the Bankless and uh, the Youth Global and all of these lovely forums, talked about the, the merge a lot. So I'm not going to talk about the merge. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it will happen. Apparently, it might even happen on Mexican Independence Day, which is, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, so switch to proof of stake, great. What comes after the switch to proof of stake, right? Um, so one, probably the biggest thing, aside from the switch to proof of stake that Ethereum developers are focusing on today and really have been focusing on for a long time is scalability. Right? So who remembers last year when it cost $5 to send a transaction? Who enjoyed paying $5 to send a transaction? <laughs> One person did, I did not, right? <laughs> so this is a problem, right? There's not enough space in the Ethereum blockchain today for all of the uh, applications that people want to make. And this means that Ethereum is too expensive for people. And this is a problem and uh, we have to fix the problem, right? Uh, so now if you look at the charts, then you know, sure today sending a transaction is maybe a few times cheaper than it was last year because last year was a bull market and now the bull market is kind of over, uh, not a bull market right now. Um, so, but you know, markets are random, right? They can go in random directions. And so we don't want to kind of rely on markets being in one place or another place for transactions to be cheap. We just, we want transactions to just always be cheap, right? And the only way to make transactions reliably cheap in the long term is to increase the uh, amount of space um, on the chain, right? Increase the amount of space that uh, transactions can use. Now, in uh, 2020, um, we, like, I published uh, this document uh, called uh, the uh, Rollup Centric Roadmap. And at the time, uh, I think the Ethereum ecosystem was really starting to move in that direction already, right? And the basic idea is to like split up uh, the uh, Ethereum ecosystem into layer one and layer two, where the job of layer one is to be decentralized, to be safe, to be open, to be censorship resistant, to be permissionless, and to really focus on uh, uh, providing these things and to become more stable and ev uh, even try to become simpler over time. And it's the job of layer two protocols to add scalability on top. Right, and that was two years ago. And two years ago, I, like rollups were mostly test networks and ideas, but 
fast forward to today, and today there's a lot of scalability projects that are live now, right? So Polygon is uh, sponsoring this, and uh, I mean, Polygon in its current form, right, it is a side chain, and so you do have to trust it, but Polygon is also, do, you know, they, they've been doing all of this excellent work on uh, zero, adding zero knowledge proofs, and so, you know, they are going to also have a yeah, ZK rollup, which is uh, really amazing, right? Now, um, also Arbitrum uh, doing, uh, move, continuing to move forward, lots of great work. Optimism, I, uh, I hear people from the Optimism team might even be here. Um, so, you know, Stark, uh, StarkNet, ZK Sync, just all of these projects that are just so much more mature uh, than they were two years ago. Now, this um, scaling through roadmaps is something that has started and it's going to continue, right? So over here I have these two charts. Um, this is, uh, so the first chart is uh, roll up data space per block, right? So this is how much space there is and there is going to be in the Ethereum blockchain for uh, people to, uh, for rollups to, uh, to use uh, to put transaction data. So today the amount is fairly low. It's basically rollups have to compete with all of the other Ethereum applications for space. And so today I think the amount of rollup data on chain is like maybe somewhere between 10 and 50 kilobytes, maybe a few days more, maybe some days less. I don't know the exact number, but like it's not far from that. Um, after the merge, the uh, next big focus of the uh, client teams is likely to be uh, what we call proto-dank sharding, um, which is also called EIP-4844. And this just adds a much larger amount of space for projects to, uh, uh, or a much larger amount of data on chain that rollups can use to store transactions. And after proto-dank sharding, we go up to full dank sharding, right? And uh, that's a typo. This, this is one megabyte, this should be 16 megabytes, right? So uh, a huge amount of space going up by a lot. Now, in the meantime, um, also uh, some work happening kind of more quietly, but still important, which is reducing the amount of space required for every transaction on a rollup, right? So this is just some data for an ERC-20 transfer. So an ERC-20 transfer on a rollup today, 180 bytes. Um, a few months ago, Optimism added like this basic form of compression that we call zero byte compression, knocks it down to one fit, well, it's about 150. Um, signature aggregation, you can knock it down to 128. Um, you need ERC-4337 for that. Better compression, 75, and like a totally amazing compression, 23, right? So on top of all of this extra space, the amount of, the amount of space that every transaction needs is slowly kind of in the process of becoming and is going to become nine times cheaper. So uh, the conclusion of uh, kind of all of these things put together, right, is that I think we have a lot of uh, good reasons to believe that the Ethereum blockchain will be like much cheaper, like more than a hundred times cheaper. Like it will be, do it like building and doing things will be more than a hundred times, maybe even a thousand times cheaper than it was last year. So the question for people building applications, right, is what, I think there's two questions. One question is, how can you help the transition? And the second question is, if things are going to be a hundred or a thousand times cheaper, what will you be able to build that you cannot build today, right? So I, in, in some of the yeah, presentations at the hackathon, I yeah, already saw, I think people are, already having like exactly the right kind of thoughts in that direction, right? So for example, a lot of applications focusing on like point of sale and uh, in-person payments. And in-person in payments are actually something like, they're probably, or just payments in general, right? They're the earliest application of a blockchain, right? So who here remembers, uh, who here read the Bitcoin white paper? Who here remembers the title of the Bitcoin white paper? Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, right? Electronic cash, use it to pay people for stuff. Now, this is something that like earlier on, I think a lot of people really believed and a lot of people really tried hard to do, right? Um, so like there's like these big efforts to try to convince a lot of like stores and restaurants in one particular place to all accept Bitcoin. There were projects trying to like convince a lot of online merchants to accept Bitcoin. And I mean, 
with Ethereum, I think this kind of continued at the beginning, but then sometime like over the last, over the next few years, transaction fees just became way too high. And I feel like the ecosystem kind of quietly mostly gave up on that, right? And I think in fairness, that kind of makes sense, right? Because uh, if you remember in uh, 2013, one of the biggest arguments that people used for why like you as someone in a store or like online store or physical store should accept Bitcoin is the fees, right? PayPal charges 29 cents plus 2.9% and even more if it's international, credit cards charge even more. And here's cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, one cent uh, transaction fees, right? So it worked in 2013, but then in 2017, instead of the transaction fee being one cent, it was $50. And so it did not work anymore, right? But with scaling, like we are looking at transaction fees going back down to one cent and, uh, you know, maybe even lower. So maybe it actually, and, you know, Today we're not in 2013, today we're in 2022. And the, uh, the size of the Ethereum community, the uh, size of the crypto space. Um, also, you know, Bitcoin people doing, I think, uh, some similar work with, uh, with the Lightning Network as well. Um, the size of the space, the uh, amount of developers that are there to, that, that, that can actually like build really good and uh, user-friendly solutions, the, uh, there's just so much more, right? So it, I think it actually makes sense to try to like do, try to do in-person pay, uh, payments and online payments again. Um, so that's just one example, right? But the, the question that you should ask is like, what other applications are not possible today or are not possible in 2021, but they are possible in a world where uh, transactions are 100 times cheaper. So that's one thing that we can build, th that um, as a developer, you can look at, right? The other thing you can look at as a developer is how might you participate in this transition, right? So in um, here, if you look at the chart closely, like there's a couple of these very specific technologies that I mentioned, right? So ERC4337, um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit later, but it's a basic uh, account abstraction. It's this uh, kind of pro standard on top of Ethereum that gives wallet designers a lot more freedom to choose like basically how wallets do their authentication. Uh, so you don't have to have one key, you can have multiple keys, you can have different signature algorithms, you can have recovery, you can do a lot of things. Um, and one of the nice things that you can do with it is a signature aggregation, right? So you can take a, a large number of signatures, combine them into one signature, and you just save a huge amount of data, right? Um, so this is something that can like make a big difference, but it's something that people have to actually do. Um, and this, so it's, and it's something that people have to implement wallets for. There are already a couple of teams um, trying to build wallets that support ERC4337, but you can build more, right? And uh, you can join those teams um, and, you know, you can build your own. It's, um, I think, an area where just a, there's still a lot more room for people to participate. Better compression for rollups, right? So like, what's the difference between like where we are now, 154 bytes and, and going down to 75 and even going down to 23? Like if you're part of a rollup team or you, know, you want to contribute to a rollup, this is one of those um, things that actually could be very valuable to uh, contribute. Um, software for nodes in a world that has some of these scalability upgrades. Right, so when the Ethereum blockchain has a lot more data, when it becomes more scal scalable, you, users are going to need to have like better software for being able to access and process all of this data. And this will not be something that the blockchain, the Ethereum node will be able to do by itself, right? So like this extra software has to be built and uh, someone, there are a lot of good projects that are building it, but this is also some, uh, a place where there could be more, right? So this is uh, the first category of, um, I think, what, how to think about what you can build, right? The scaling transition is happening and will, and will continue to happen. How can you help the transition? And once we have the transition, what kinds of things that you cannot, be, cannot build today will you be able to build a couple of years in the future? Those are the things that it makes sense to start building today. Um, zero knowledge proofs. So 
Zero-knowledge proofs are this uh, very powerful technology that has become very big in the Ethereum ecosystem over the last five years. Right? Basically, it's a way to cryptographically prove that like, some statement about some piece of data is correct without revealing the yeah, information about like, why that statement is true. So you can say, like, for example, that I have an Ethereum address and that Ethereum address has a valid proof of humanity profile, but you don't have to reveal which proof of humanity profile you have. Right, so you can kind of like you can get, have applications that increase security by kind of adding these uh, uh, guarantees into the application, but at the same time preserve privacy. Now, privacy is actually only one use case of zk snarks. Right, the other use case of zk snarks that somehow the exact same technology gives us is scalability. And uh, for scalability, ZK Snarks are already being used in uh, ZK rollups today, right? So Polygon, Polygon, Hermes, um, ZK rollup. Yay. Um, come on, clap for the sponsor. They're here. OK. Um, the, right now, they're not the only one, right? So ZK Sync doing amazing work, uh, Scroll doing amazing work, the Ethereum Foundations team with Barry Whitehead also um, doing amazing work, StarkNet with Cairo, also uh, doing amazing work. But so a lot of work that's happening on ZK for scalability and ZK for privacy. Now, in from the point of view of an application developer, right? So my perspective on this is that the ZK for Snarks for scalability stuff, that's like mostly protocol level and mostly infrastructure level, right? So it will happen in ZK rollups and you don't actually need to worry too much about it, um, but it just will make everything that you do more secure and cheaper. ZK snarks for privacy are a bit different, right? Because like as an application designer, you have to think about your application's privacy um, situation, right? The privacy needs of every application are different, and there isn't like a way to magically provide privacy for everything, right? Like there is a, there there's some pretty like fundamental technical reasons why you can't. Like basically, you can't hide all the data from everyone because in order to make a transaction with the data, you have to have the data, right? That's like the the easiest way to think about it. And so for every application, you have this question of like. Well, who is going to have the data and how are you going to use these proofs? And like, who has the right to make what changes to the, to the data? You know, how are you encrypting things? How are you hashing things and all of this? Now, some interesting examples of this. Um, privacy preserving proof of humanity is like a very simple one, right? It's some um, like, if you want to create an application, like one very um, simple example of this might be that, like, let's say you want uh, people to be able to, like, sign, like, you want to be, um, you have some um, some conference, and you want people to be able to, like, sign up and buy tickets for a con to that conference, but you want to limit your ticket purchases to one per person, right? So, but at the same time, you also don't want to, like, reveal everyone's information publicly on chain. How do you do all of those things at the same time? Well, you can, you, you can make a zero knowledge proof that says, in order to buy a, a ticket, you have to provide a proof. And that proof proves that you have a proof of humanity profile. And at the same time, it reveals this kind of extra secret called a nullifier. And if you make two proofs with the same profile, they're going to have the same nullifier, right? And so, if you just the nullifier by itself does not reveal anything, but it still stops you from using the same profile more than once. So, this is something. I mean, I I actually have a post on uh, my blog. I wrote I wrote this a couple of months about like some very specific ways about how you use this technology, but it is powerful, right? And if you're building an application, you probably do have privacy needs. And it's important to think about those privacy needs. And ZK Snarks are just a very powerful technology for dealing with privacy issues. Um, sometimes there are there are privacy solutions that are kind of simpler, and you don't need ZK Snarks. Um, so 
Um, one uh, thing that I mentioned publicly about a week ago is uh, stealth addresses, right? So if you want to send someone in an, in an FT and, and they have a public address, like you don't have to send it to their public address directly. You can generate a stealth address and you can generate an address that they control, but nobody aside from them knows that they control that address. Um, and so like this is, it's a little bit more low tech, but it's also another way to like just not leak a little bit less information out to the public so everyone can see. Um, so privacy. Um, another really important um, category of applications is the Ethereum identity ecosystem. And this is actually one of my answers to the question of uh, like, what can you build when Ethereum is cheaper that you cannot, bu that you cannot build when Ethereum is expensive, right? So I think like, I, uh, I've become convinced that like, aside from money and financial applications, things to do with identity are probably the second biggest like, category of uh, applications on Ethereum, right? And uh, I think the reason for this is, uh, is pretty clear, right? Because uh, Ethereum and like, blockchains by themselves, in order to interact with them at all, you need to already have an identity, right? So who here has a, uh, uh, an Ethereum wallet? Okay, who here has a PGP key? See, not, not that many people, right? So this is like one of, this is one of these kind of double-edged swords of, uh, of blockchains and crypto, right? So back in the 1990s, there were like a lot of people that had these like very idealistic ideas, right? That we have encryption now and we can protect privacy and we can communicate with each other and we don't need to have corporations and governments like snoop on everything. Now, so the, but, and then they created all of this like amazing software and everyone could generate their own key. Anyone could send messages encrypted to other people's keys, but it just never really went very far, right? Like this is a group of developers, but if I asked this at a non-technical Ethereum conference, I feel, you know, there would still be a lot of people raising hands for an Ethereum wallet, but probably almost no one raising their hands for a PGP key, right? Why? Well, PGP keys, they're like, a very difficult network effect to start, right? You have one application and no one else is using the application. And so you're only really going to use it if your friends are using it already. And it's just very difficult to get off the ground. Now, you know, you could of course argue like, hey, you know, we believe in freedom, we believe in privacy, we believe, you know, we believe in like these wonderful ideologies um, and like try to kind of convince people that way. But in, you know, it didn't go very far. Now, instead, we have blockchains, right? And with blockchains, we have money and we have incentives and we have, um, you know, people wanting to trade like $3 million monkeys. And, you know, these... Now, of, you know, there are big downsides to these, but like one of the upsides is that people definitely have incentives, right? And so it just created, it did create this incentive for even like very normal people, like just uh, people who are not interested, like, you know, don't, aren't kind of like very deeply involved, like interested in kind of ideology and like freedom and privacy, like just more reg like regular people that just, um, you know, wants to save money, um, not lose their money to, um, you know, hyperinflation, uh, be able to send money internationally, just like do very simple things. And, um, or, you know, just to like do the, like do these things, they have, you know, you have to create a wallet. And once you have that wallet, you can use that wallet for so many other things, right? So, one of my dreams here is that we can kind of use this, this as a path to improving how identity works on the internet in general, right? So like one of the problems with identity on the yeah, internet as it exists today is that it, it's like very centralized, right? Like you, you sign in with Google, sign in with Facebook and sign in with Twitter and you just have like one company that controls your account. They see everything that you do. They can, they can control everything that you do. Now, and you don't actually get that much in exchange, right? So like one argument that people sometimes make is that like, oh, it's good that, if a, co that a company controls your account because well, if you, like, if you accidentally screw up, you accidentally lose your key, you can call customer service and the company will help you get, you get your accounts back. This is actually often not true, right? Like in reality, like I've talked to lots of people who have lost their accounts and it's actually very hard to get your accounts back. Um, so 
what if instead we could use Ethereum accounts and we can use Ethereum accounts to log into services so, and even log into centralized Web2 services. So instead of sign in with Google, we have sign in with Ethereum. So this is something that the Ethereum Foundation actually started like, you know, pushing uh, kind of pretty hard last year. We gave, you know, gave a grants to Spruce um, and a lot of other people in the Ethereum ecosystem are really kind of pushing on this. And there's more and more applications that are starting to just let you sign in with an Ethereum account. And, you know, especially if you want to target like people, you know, the Ethereum ecosystem and the, crypt the, the crypto community, it's very convenient. Now, how do you recover your accounts, right? Let's say you have an Ethereum account and either your account gets stolen or you lose your account. Today, we're not very good at this, right? Now, there are backups and there are seed phrases and all of these things, but you know what happens if your account gets stolen, right? It, does, it doesn't really help. Um, and sometimes um, you know, people are careless with their backups, Sometimes like really, you know, really bad things still happen. Sometimes people are lazy. So one of the ideas that I've been like a big fan of for a long time is this idea of social recovery wallets, right? Basically the idea is that like you as a user would choose some number of uh, recovery contacts. This could be institutions, it could be family, it could be friends, it, you know, you, you choose who they are. Um, some, it could even be other wallets that you control. Um, and if you choose some number of them, then like, let's say for example, you choose seven recovery contacts, you might need four of them or you might want five of them to be able to recover your account if you lose your account, right? Now, it's, a, it, it's actually, you can even make it privacy preserving, like you can make it so that you don't reveal to the chain who your recovery contacts are. Um, and your recovery contacts don't even have to know who each other are, right? So it's like actually pretty uh, pretty strong against collusion. Um, so this could be done and it, can, it could work quite well, um, but in order to do this, you have to have an account that is a smart contract wallet, right? So like you can't use a regular account, you have to use a smart contract wallet. Now, how can we make it easy to use a smart contract wallet to access your funds? Well. So, ERC-4337, right? This is a uh, kind of protocol uh, that sits on top of Ethereum that's designed to make it really easy to do this. So what do we have now, right? You have your in Ethereum account, which is an account, and that is like an identity. Um, if you want to recover your account, you can make it be a smart contract wallet. Um, if you want to use your account, you can sign in with it. Um, now, if you have generally in the centralized world, you have a username, right? And in Ethereum, we have a username. You have ENS. Um, you can prove things about your account, right? So you can prove that, like, if you want to prove that you are like some actual real account and that you're not a spammer, there's a lot of things that you can prove. You can prove that your account just sent at least one transaction on Ethereum. Um, you can prove that you have like some uh, proof of humanity profile. You can prove that you have a Pope. You can prove that you have like some minimum balance. You can prove that you participated in some event. You can even zero knowledge prove all of these things, right? So between all of these different applications together, I actually think that like we have a pretty powerful um, identity layer already on Ethereum. And all that we really need to do is just build better versions of all of these different pieces on the stack and like start getting them to talk to each other more and like really start con uh, connecting things together much more. And this is also something that I think as a yeah, builder, um, you can absolutely participate in, right? So that's uh, a few, you know, a few, a few examples of uh, things that we can build. There's lots of other things that I think are important. Uh, so public goods funding is um, important. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of good ideas around like making better quadratic funding applications, um, better ways to do credit assignments to like figure out exactly like all of the different participants that are responsible for making some public good happen. So not just the person who claims credit at the end, but kind of the entire tree that led up to them. Um, there are better ways to, to do uh, governance for DAOs, um, also important. Um, better kind of meta applications, like applications that other applications can talk to, right? So I think there's this big long list of things that are worth making, but I also think that, you know, it's, uh, 
another thing that's important to realize here, right, is that like the technology is making it easier to build these things in a way that was not true two years ago, right? Like two years ago, we did not have scalability, and you cannot, you could not practically do any of this. Um, two years ago, zero knowledge proof technology was just not as good. It was much, you know, it was much more difficult to use. And so, two years ago, it was just much more difficult to build anything privacy preserving. Um, two years ago, we did not have like many parts of this stack. And when you only have like one part of the stack, it's very difficult to do other things. But when you have like some version of all parts of the stack, then it becomes much easier to build even better versions of any part of the stack, right? So technology is improving, and I think it's possible for you know any of you to help participate in making the this effort of making the technology better and more secure and uh, you know more reliable, cheaper, and more accessible. But also really start thinking about well, what kinds of new applications will all of this and new technology make possible? Mm-hmm.